Oh yes, this yes, is my yes, screen. Yes. Yeah, is it working? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will introduce together with with Paola from uh, the Spanish National Node of Eris uh, collaboration opportunities and requirements for this collaboration to be possible. Uh, and I will start with uh, the requirements, especially starting from the definition. We spoke a lot about Eris. We did not speak much about Eric, uh, and this is the most a boring part, but it is very important that you understand what is an ERIC to understand how you can collaborate or, or join us. Uh, an ERIC is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium. Uh, so it is a legal entity recognized across the EU. So it is a, a private entity is automatically recognized in every EU country. Uh, in many ways, it is comparable to a small intergovernmental organization uh, in a way that uh, for tax reasons it is the same. And uh, it has countries as members or observers, not individual partners or institutions. It is non-profit. But the difference compared to other uh, structures, it, it's that it's completely dedicated to research. Uh, it was designed by the European Commission to really answer the need of, of research communities. Uh, it can be single-sided or uh, distributed, which is our case with national node structures that was introduced uh, before. So these ERICs, they provide uh, very flexible governance structures, which is uh, very useful and in our case, useful also to incorporate the feedback and the participation of other uh, actors through different advisory boards, or different commissions, working groups, etc. And it's also very useful to have it uh, a functioning distributed infrastructure. As a, as a legal entity and compared to the previous projects, it is perennial, it has no ending date, uh, which is a, a very important progress for our communities that needed every three to four years to reapply for funding. And every time we were not sure to have the funding. So this is perennial, it has its own legal personality, it can hire personnel. So it is more uh, a long-term commitment of the members and the observers. Uh, it provides benefits and services to the members uh, and to the general heritage science community at the European level and worldwide. But it provides some benefits are limited to the members, especially some networking activities applying to consortia. So there is a benefit of being a full member compared to not being a full member. Not everything is accessible uh, for the whole community. And if you are a member, uh, you can benefit in some uh, in some specific ways from VAT exemptions if you are a EU country, but this is not the most significant advantage. Um, of being an ERIC. So these ERICs are creating after quite a long procedure where member states uh, commit at the European level and the European Commission eventually decides to create this infrastructure by publishing an implementing decision in the uh, official journal of the European Union. So this is, there is a diplomatic component to it. It takes uh, quite a long time, usually uh, between five to ten years, sometimes even more. Um, so it shows a long, really the long commitment of the different members. Um, now that I spoke a little bit about what is an ERIC, uh, I can tell you how uh, you can participate formally. So you as uh, a country, not a region, it must be or, or, or a state, a federal state or a lender, but it has to be at the national level through your diplomatic representation. Uh, so it is part of international law. Uh, ERIS members or any ERIC members are typically uh, members of the European Union or what we call associated countries. Associated countries are, are countries that participate in the uh, Horizon Europe program or, or in the next ones. So there is already quite a long list. Uh, most of them are located uh, within Europe or in the neighborhood. But some of them, for example, New Zealand will become associated. So the list is, is quite long. 
Uh, and then we can also have as full members or observers other countries, so any other country, and intergovernmental inter organizations. Uh, but there are some, some, some rules that, as was mentioned before, uh, can be a deterring factors for other countries to join as members because um, European law is very clear that EU member states and associates must have a majority of voting shares in the General Assembly. All contributions must be made in Europe and they must recognize the authority of the European Court of Justice for any dispute related to an ERIC. So this is an important point. It does not mean that you recognize the whole EU law. You have to recognize that in the case of a conflict, which to my knowledge never happened in the history of ERICs at the moment, in about uh, 15 years, but could happen, we never know, uh, the authority to um, that will have the final say on the conflict will be the European Court of Justice, and it will this decision will be based on EU law. It does not mean that you have to comply with EU law or, or for your infrastructure or, or the rest. This is a very important distinction to make. Um, so having said that, we have two types of, of formal memberships. So we have the members. So member countries or, or IGO commit for five years initially, but as was mentioned, really this is a long-term commitment. So uh, we anticipate that it will be more than five years, but officially the first commitment uh, lasts uh, five years. So they vote in the General Assembly. This is one vote per country or per member. They must organize a national node and they enjoy the full rights and full access to everything that was presented before. And then we have observers as it is customary in, in, in IGOs. Uh, observers only commit for three years. They, it can be renewa renewable once. And after these two periods of observership, they have to either uh, leave or become a member. We have created in very specific cases possibility to become a permanent observer, which is close to a member. But for most countries, this observer status is uh, limited. Observers cannot vote, of course, uh, and they enjoy limited rights, but still they can claim they are part of Eris and use this advantage to apply to competitive grants and participate in activities, and they pay a reduced uh, contribution. So contributions, uh, which means really cash fees, are calculated based on a flat rate and the GDP of the country. Um, so as you understand, not every one of you would be interested in, in becoming a member. There are some political um, factors that could prevent uh, some countries to become a member on Observer. So we have really three main modes of collaboration. We have occasional collaboration on specific events, which already happens, but Eris will be very happy to co-organize a conference or co-organize any kind of event on an occasional basis. This, this can be done through joining the central hub, the director general or the national nodes. So this is the simplest and probably the most common way of collaborating. It doesn't really require any formal agreement. And then we can have joint actions. Uh, we can submit project proposals together. Uh, we can have representation in, in advisory boards. Uh, we can have a more structured collaboration without having a full uh, framework agreement. So this is kind of the middle option for collaboration. And we already have this kind of relationship with several uh, institutions of countries that are uh, connected today. And then we have the final, the most formal part uh, way of collaboration, collaborating, which is in many ways close to being a member or an observer. This is a formal strategic partnership. So we have a document uh, that can be legally binding or not that describes rights and obligations of each uh, party to the agreement. Uh, so this is if you wish to have a long-term 
across several years, multi-topic collaboration. This is the best uh, way to engage with ARIS. And these agreements will be negotiated, of course, on a case-by-case -case basis uh, with the uh, Director General of ARIS. So now that I finished with the requirements, I will leave the floor to Paola, who will talk about the uh, opportunities. Thank you very much, uh, Rumi. As has been already highlighted in this workshop, uh, collaboration is key, it's an intrinsic uh, element of EU's identity, I mean, at increasing not only human resources, but material, but financial resources to benefit the whole uh, health science domain, domain and also the, the society at large. So, but specifically uh, what Eris can offer to his members. So here in, with the slide, I present uh, some of the benefits that the members um, can have, some uh, like the internal access to that to be that, uh, could be regulated by a specific policy to the Eris Eric expertise, to our unique expertise, also to research uh, facilities and infrastructure management best practices. Um, it is also offered the access to consortia, already mentioned by Rumi, applying for funding using the Eris, Eris Eric uh, label. Uh, being a member of ARIS enable uh, facilities to jointly develop research and project consortia, courses, or dissemination engagement activities. And also, uh, members have the option to have in house training recognized and integrated into the ARIS uh, training system as the, uh, in the HS, uh, via the HS Academy, already presented by Mattia. And uh, members can participate in fora regulating access and standards of quality and they will be associated or they are associated with the ERIS ERIC label. So ERIS is open to the addition or association of EU and non-EU countries and organizations towards the long-term objective of operating at the global level. Next, please. So what are the opportunities uh, for collaboration? There are many in different areas. Uh, Remy already introduced some of them. And these are the areas most uh, uh, in which the collaboration can take part regarding the scientific strategy, the transnational access platform, training, uh, regarding outreach activities, management, policy, technology transfer, and data management, to name a few. Uh, next, please. And to be more concrete, I here present some of examples in the different areas, uh, opportunities for collaboration. For instance, regarding the scientific strategy, um, there could be opportunities for a collaboration in joint actions for the creation of new opportunities for research, to identify uh, research priorities or to address some extraordinary research uh, questions. Another opportunity of collaboration is through exchange of experience and expertise by creating consortia from transnational goals and funding opportunities etc. Regarding the platform, as we already mentioned, there's the possibility of uh, provision of uh, services via bilateral agreements and also access to IRIS facilities. Um, also, another opportunity of collaboration is, that is by defining the access policy of IRIS. Regarding training, already mentioned uh, by uh, Mattia, there here a few. One opportunity is develop Developing uh, training modules, participation and promotion in seminar, lectures, workshop, and another opportunity is the student exchange or in a broader uh, sense, the staff exchange. And regarding outreach, uh, one of, way of collaborating is by a uh, conception and or promotion of dissemination activities to increase the uh, awareness of citizens, stakeholders, and policymakers, and also by reaching new communities. And regarding managing, management by supporting and sharing uh, best uh, practices with policy by bringing your expertise and also by working uh, on policy alignment on, on common best practices. And regarding on technology transfer, uh, one way of collaborating is by developing innovating, innovation promotion activities uh, by participating also in the marketing strategy of EGIS. And regarding data management, there are multiple, multiple ways such as supporting and sharing use and sustainability of digital resources, only data, but also software, tools, or any other kind of tool. 
and also by developing protocols, uh, workflows, uh, workflows etc. And uh, next, please. And uh, finally, I would like to present some recent and ongoing uh, collaborations um, in Iberian HS project that uh, already mentioned what finished last March. Uh, we have the participation of US, US, sorry, Mexico, Israel, Germany, Norway, Denmark, uh, Sweden, the Czech Republic and, and Brazil. And here I would like to, to present uh, one example of collaboration with Anticipa, which is the Brazilian Association for Research in Technology and Heritage Science. And uh, this um, collaboration consi consisted in the organization of a workshop, workshop and a pilot activity on data interoperability to address the main issues of uh, sharing scientific uh, data by complying with the fair uh, principles and regarding ongoing collaborations here there are a few one with uh, currently with open air uh, on uh, data management um, for transferring the heritage science component uh, gateway to heritage that was already created during a period of test it's a way of having all our research outcome, uh, outcomes in open access Another um, a collaboration is uh, with OPRA, the Open Call for Open Science Project and Services that closed two days ago uh, with the idea of promote their sharing of research data and also uh, comply with the third principles across different scientific domains in the expert roadmap in which it is, uh, is, is there. And uh, finally, that was already mentioned, it's about policy making and uh, global change is our collaboration with ARTS the Alliance for Research on Cultural Heritage in Europe, a project that aims to prepare the Resilient Cultural Heritage uh, Partnership that will highlight the, the cooperation with research infrastructures such as IRIS. And next, please. That, that's all. Thank you. Um,